Hello. In today's episode of Understanding Computer Sound, we're talking about Apple II. In the previous episode, uh, called, titled Beep, uh, we put ZX Spectrums, Apple IIs, PCs, all in one bucket of, of those systems we generated sound using one bit output and basically taking the speaker on and off. And uh, a lot of basics of uh, how that sound was generated, a lot uh, of terminology related to square rectangular waves, uh, pulse with modulation duty cycle is covered in that episode. I highly recommend that episode if you're not familiar with uh, with the basics of a square wave uh, generated sound. Now, ZX Spectrums and Apple IIs were slightly different from PCs in how that square wave was generated. Specifically, in the early PCs, there was a programmable interrupt timer, a PIT chip that uh, would be driving the uh, speaker while the CPU was free to do something else. In ZX Spectrums and in Apple IIs, uh, the speaker was driven directly by uh, the CPU, which means that the programmer would, had to be very careful in how they, they timed their program in order to keep the sound undistorted and keep it playing. We'll have a look at a few uh, programs today uh, that uh, showed various ways of how programmers dealt with that program with that problem of timing their uh, software but also uh, how they dealt with uh, more challenging aspects of sound like polyphony uh, ASDR uh, envelope and other aspects volume too uh, remember that we're talking about one bit sound basically on and off how can you uh, control volume there. Let's look into that. Let's dive into a few example programs. I have already uh, uploaded uh, quite a few of them to several of my machines. I have four Apple IIs uh, uh, switched on now here and they are, uh, uh, they are all outputting sound via this mixer behind me. I have two Apple uh, Cs, one Apple II E, and they're uh, behind the, the mixer. You can see it. There's a uh, Apple II GS, which is slightly more advanced uh, regarding uh, computer sound generation, but which can also work in the um, plain uh, speak, uh, plain mode of uh, driving the speaker uh, on and off, and we'll use it in such a way. We'll look at two GS in uh, future episodes, and uh, we will look at, into the. Uh, a more advanced um, uh, sound chip that was used there. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, as a, an example of very simple uh, tune that was used in one of the games, I took uh, the game uh, Family Feud by uh, Share Data, uh, which was uh, uh, developed in 1984, and it shows the use of simple square wave of 50% duty cycle uh, nothing uh, too spectacular, but the tune is pretty nice. Let me reboot, I think it's this computer that has it. Let me unmute it. And uh, let's see what it sounds like. By, uh, by the way, you've noticed the reboot sound of Apple II was, already, was also registered as a square wave. It's a simple 50% duty cycle square wave that boots the boot beep of Apple II. Now, let's listen to the sound of that game. And I froze... There, it's step playing. I froze the oscilloscope just to show that we're, all the sounds generated there were a very simple uh, square wave uh, put ingeniously together to create an engaging tune. Now, another game uh, where again, again uh, fifty percent duty cycle wave was used uh, is this famous uh, game Frogger by Konami and Sega uh, from nineteen eighty one, even earlier than uh, Family Feud, uh, and I really love the uh, intro tune there. Let me 
try and switch the right output on and let's play it. That was the tune. Uh, the tune, by the way, uh, is uh, an old uh, nursery rhyme, a Japanese nursery rhyme, uh, about not a frog, uh, surprisingly, but about the cat and the dog. But uh, never mind that. The interesting part in that tune was that uh, there were two melody lines played. One was uh, the uh, bass or uh, like a low register uh, melody, and the other one was more treble or uh, high register uh, tune and those two were played in uh, like uh, they, they were swapped uh, the programmer swapped the uh, playing of those melodies uh, between one and and the other in such a way that and in, and so fast that it created a kind of nice counterpoint uh, effect uh, to the listener and basically both of those melodies a high and low register uh, could be considered as contiguous uh, uh, melodies a very nice effect uh, and uh, before we go to the next uh, game uh, let's listen to it again that was frogger now i mentioned about how ingenious the programmer had to be in order to keep the program running while at the same time uh, playing sounds or music. An example of uh, how brilliantly uh, it was solved uh, uh, by developers is the game Miss Pac-Man uh, by uh, General Computer Corporation from 1982 and uh, let's try and load it here on this Apple uh, 2E. That was the intro tune, and let's play. What ha what's happening now is I'm walking Miss Pac-Man and collecting the dots and running away from ghosts, but at the same time you hear the sounds of her eating the dots and eating the ghosts. I hope I can chase one of the... Oh no, I didn't manage to do that. Now I will. All those sounds are generated while the character is moving about uh, in the game. Uh, that required a lot, a lot of thinking on the part of the programmer and timing the interrupt and interrupting the game in such a way that it keeps being playable while the sounds are uh, being generated. Genius work, I love it and the game is uh, really uh, very playable. The next one, where also similar um, uh, techniques were used, uh, is Dig Dug uh, by Namco uh, Atari uh, from 1983. Let me try and load it. I think I have it here. I have created the entire series of of games here to show. Let's res reset this one and see if we can load Dig Dug. Uh, there it is. I hope the mixer has the right way. That's the intro tune. The character is getting ready. And now, now I'm already walking the character up and down, left and right. And listen, there's still music playing. So the, the programmer had to do the timing of character moves and what's happening on the screen in such a way that music is not interrupted. There is a melody in the background, you see. Again. You can discern melody. Of course, it's, it's being interrupted. Remember, the screen has to refresh, the character has to move, the program has to respond to key presses while the melody is playing. It's all driven by that 8-bit uh, uh, 6502 CPU there in Apple IIe. Uh, so uh, games like these uh, took a lot of time to develop, a lot of ingenuity, and uh, I really admire uh, 
uh, the uh, the effort that uh, went to it, uh, went to it and the uh, creative thought. That was the game Dig Duck. Now, an important part in the techniques of generating uh, sound in um, uh, Apple II as well as ZX Spectrum or early PCs was the ability to control the um, duty cycle of uh, square wave. Uh, we mentioned that already uh, in our uh, episode titled Beep, but uh, today let's try and simulate the effects of, um, uh, of uh, modulating uh, the uh, duty cycle on our Apple II. So I wrote a very simple um, assembly program to uh, try and understand the effect myself and try to observe the uh, behavior of rectangular waves and its impact on the perceived sound. Uh, and that program uh, basically allows me to uh, use the keyboard to modulate the frequency of the wave and uh, another set of keys to, to modulate um, the duty cycle. Let's see how that works. I already loaded it uh, here on this uh, Apple to see, And uh, let's uh, enable the sound now. So what we're seeing now is a square wave that is... Uh, um, it's not 50% uh, uh, duty cycle, but a little bit less than that, uh, but still close. And the, the yellow line represents the, the wave itself, while the red line here represents the, uh, compos the com uh, how that wave is composed of uh, harmonic frequencies. And the leftmost very, very tall uh, red line, I hope it can be seen, uh, represents the fundamental harmonic of square wave and the other ones are the uh, secondary, tertiary harmonic, etc, etc. There is in actually an in infinite number of them. Let's see what happens when I modulate the... without changing the frequency I modulate the uh, duty cycle. Let's decrease the duty cycle of that wave. You can immediately hear the effect but let's see the effect on the left hand side. You see that the red bar on the very left hand side gets lower and lower. The fundamental harmonic, as we decrease the duty cycle, the fundamental harmonic gets less and less dominating. I went too far, but that effect of modulating look up and down, the fundamental harmonic goes up and down, becomes less and less mo dominating as we decrease the duty cycle. That effect allowed the programmer basically to control the volume of the output sound, which seems almost impossible. Remember, we're talking about one bit sound, either on and off. But now we are able to control the volume when we go to very, very thin pulses and stay there and try to modulate them. Uh, that effect was used a lot. And let's see uh, a few examples. Let me switch to a different channel. I have preloaded here on that Apple IIe a very interesting program by uh, David Schmeng uh, from 2017, very recent one, called Oscillation Over Thruster. And what it does is it basically lets us play certain sounds. I hope uh, we can hear them. I think we should. So as I play the keyboard, it generates certain sounds. And let's look at the effect here on the oscilloscope. Let me switch it on one second. Okay, I was able now to adjust the oscilloscope to what I want to show. So basically, as we climb up the scale here in oscillation over thruster uh, program, we increase the frequency of sound, and that can be seen uh, on uh, by you know by the, when we look at the spacing between the individual pulses here. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting interesting part is that listen to the sound as it fades away. The fading away of, of that sound was achieved by modulating the very thin pulse uh, here and its width. If we look closer, because from, from here it looks like these are just lines. These are rectangular uh, waves, but uh, wave shapes, but they are very thin and they look like lines. If we increase the scale and we see indiv an individual pulse, Forget for now why it looks tri triangular rather than uh, rectangular. We'll get to that. But if we look at a single, single pulse here, 
You see, it starts very thin, but as we as the sound fades fades away, it gets thinner and thinner. So by now, I think this looks pretty good. The author of this program is starting from, I calculated it, roughly 1.5% of the frequency of a given sound, which is very, uh, very low duty cycle. And then that, uh, that pulse gets even thinner and that's how he decreases the um, volume of sound, its power over time. And he was able to achieve the, what is called an envelope of sound, basically attack uh, delay, sustain, release uh, cycles of uh, of the sound over time, uh, which is a pretty great achievement uh, for a one-bit output uh, um, uh, computer. Uh, and uh, and I really love uh, playing with this uh, little program. I may even use it in uh, future episodes uh, to generate one of the uh, jingles or uh, tunes for uh, uh, for my videos. Uh, very nice. And uh, and shows the power of controlling very uh, very uh, narrow uh, pulse widths. Surprisingly, oscillation over thruster, brilliant as it is, has not reached yet the levels of sophistication that is possible with Apple II platform uh, as far as sound generation goes. Um, many more advanced techniques are being explored, uh, for example, in um, an excellent article called One Bit Instrument by Blake Troyes, published in 2020, very recent one, where the author dissects the One Bit output platforms. He focuses specifically on ZX Spectrum, but it doesn't matter. It, the challenges and the uh, techniques to overcome them uh, are basically the same. And there he describes, as I said, multiple techniques, uh, advanced techniques of building sound uh, using rectangular uh, waves. One of them uh, is basically using a carrier frequency, carrier frequency that is inaudible, uh, cannot be heard by humans or is on the border of uh, uh, human hearing. And that carrier frequency is there to maintain the speaker in one of the intermediate positions between minimum and maximum. Uh, thanks to that carrier frequency, the composer is able to generate many more than just on and off states and by that modulate the output uh, in a very precise way. One of the programs that uh, uses that technique is RT Synth, synth by um, Michael Mahon, uh, published in the early 2000s, I think 2005, uh, where he uses precisely that. What you're seeing now on the oscilloscope is the carrier frequency that cannot be heard by humans, or it can be heard if you're uh, relatively young, if your hearing is good, and uh, uh, your volume is way up, and uh, you really uh, focus on that hearing. Let me see if actually it's being being represented here volume slightly up you should be able to hear that hissing or very high pitched sound if your hearing is good and uh, and again if you're relatively young people lose the ability to hear very high pitched sounds as they age now this is the representation of that wave and let's start to uh, dissect it a little bit the first thing that you notice we've been talking in our previous episode beep and everywhere and all the time until now we've been talking about square or rectangular waves i promised to say why uh, the rectangular waves don't really look like uh, rectangular ones uh, in uh, some uh, in uh, in some of our views so uh, look at this wave what what you see here is a very close zoom this wave is of relatively high frequency, as I said, beyond human hearing. Uh, the distance between crests of this wave is over 40, maybe 50 microseconds. We're talking about microseconds. One microsecond is one millionth of a second. So this is like a microscopic view of a sound wave. 
we can't hear it. It's so uh, uh, the, the frequency is so high. Now, in this kind of uh, in, in on at that level of zoom, we see that the slopes, the rising slope and the falling slope of a wave are not straight anymore. We see that it takes time, significant time, several microseconds to raise the signal to a uh, higher level and to drop it to a lower level. And the, the whole point of this carrier frequency is to be able to change the high and low states frequently enough so it doesn't reach the highest possible level. The highest possible level for that wave would be somewhere here and the lowest would be somewhere here but it that never reaches that that's why we're not seeing the square wave and the you know flat line stop at the bottom we're seeing raising and falling slopes and almost like a sine wave or sort of wave whatever you see the point is that we're not reaching the highest and lowest level we're maintaining the signal and the speaker consequently in an intermediate state now this is the key of that uh, of the uh, method to create multiple uh, levels of, um, of volume between max and min. Uh, basically, if we, at this level, if we change the width, pulse width slightly, we will get the signal reaching higher to the, like uh, closer to the highest and or closer to the lowest. So by very careful modulating of that pulse width at this frequency, we're, we are able to put the signal wherever we want on that Y axis of our uh, graph. And let's see how that works. So RT synth here, uh, loaded here on that uh, Apple IIe, uh, displays a keyboard and you are able to play uh, a, mu a piece of music on that. Let me see if that's actually connected to our mixer, it is. Uh, let me play something. Ah, it's difficult to play on a keyboard, but yeah, you could hear a melody. So, the author of Artisynth, Michael Mahon, was able to create a wavetable of sounds similar to certain instruments by modulating the, the underlying frequency, the carrier frequency, the, its width in a very precise manner. So wh when I press a key, look what's happening. You see that carrier wave starts to shake because it's either closer or to the maximum or or further from the maximum. Now, this is the carrier frequency zoom, but if we zoom in very closely, let's start zooming and let's start playing maybe higher pitched sound. You see that shaking is becoming more visible and as we are approaching as we are approaching let me set the trigger to something here. As we're approaching audible frequencies, we can see the waves being built out of those shakes which we've seen on the very, uh, very microscopic level. So our microscopic level showed the carrier frequency, whereas our macroscopic level, let's call it, is showing actual audible frequencies that are built out of those shakes. Amazing stuff. and. Uh, it sort of uh, reminds me of how an image is built out of pixels. You have control over every single pixel of an image on a computer screen. But when you look at the whole screen, you don't see an individual pixel or you don't care about it. What you see is the full image and that's, that's, what, we, uh, that's what we see. And here, what we hear is the audible frequency. We don't care about those individual shakes that are building, building them up on the carrier frequency level. Genius work, amazing stuff. He spent a lot of time researching that. He was able to reach the frequency of, like if we zoom out again, that frequency, even if it's, if the RT synth is silent, we're not playing anything. That frequency is constantly there. Uh, and the frequency is of 22 kilohertz. The distance between those 
to top uh, those those crests is uh, around uh, between 40 and 50 uh, microseconds as i said which translates to 22 kilohertz of carrier frequency it's a very high uh, frequency on the border of human hearing and this is this is really uh, genius work i i really love it um, uh, as i said michael mahon spent a lot of time on that he and he presented it as a module that can be used in other software um, so uh, that that uh, wavetable uh, generation sound generation can be used by other um, pieces of software i'm going to show one um, in a second but michael mahon also uh, built a separate um, uh, program called uh, called uh, i think uh, drummer or rt drummer I need to s I need to look it up. Uh, I'll post the name later. I forgot currently, but it's it's based on the same technology of modulating the uh, carrier frequency uh, pulse width uh, in a very precise manner. And but this one, instead of playing synthesized sounds of of uh, various instruments, it just plays drums. So you basically have a drum machine. Let me switch it on. and see if we can hear it yeah there it is it's a very simple uh, rhythm that i created so basically you have drum machine uh, you can even play something here let me lower the octave and you can play something feeling almost like a dj Remember, we're talking about one-bit machines. Theoretically, they should be able to only tick the speaker on and off. How much can be possible with genius work of uh, and genius creative work of, uh, um, of uh, uh, a programmer? Uh, amazing stuff definitely I'm going to use it in uh, again in one of my uh, little tunes or jingles uh, can't wait to compose something with it uh, interestingly enough and an anecdotally uh, uh, anecdotally uh, uh, let me let me show you again the audible scale here okay we're playing something that's increase the octave so this is our audible sound and it's like if we have electric bass here switched on as the wavetable we are seeing like regular close to sine waves but michael mahon uh, created several instruments and one of them is actually square wave so if we switch that to square wave look what's happening what are we doing here we're using tiny square waves tiny square waves to build audible square waves so uh, it's like almost a meta square wave here that is being built and if we go to higher frequency we see that let's zoom in that the individual individual uh, waves of that square wave let's stop here are built up of just a few just a few of those carrier frequency ups and downs brilliant stuff uh, you can learn a lot just by looking at the waves uh, and uh, and it, again it took a lot of ingenu ingenuity to uh, to come up with uh, something like this let me uh, I mentioned that we can uh, that uh, Michael Mahon's uh, DAC 522 he called the, the component comp uh, which uh, which generates the waves which is used in RT synth and in the drummer the, uh, he called it DAC 522, which means like digital to audio converter. 522 meaning five bits of resolution between up and down uh, states and uh, 22 um, kilohertz uh, carrier frequency. So DAC 522 was made available by Michael Mahon to other programmers so that can, they can use it in their demos, in their games. And I, that's, that's one of the examples of it. Let me try and play that this is the music a 
again, based on Michael Mahon's uh, DAC 5.2 audio component and built by uh, Simon Williams in 2007. Uh, brilliant work, it's called, uh, the disc is called Micro Music and the piece that we're hearing is uh, Summer at the Berghof. What we hear now is there are silences which outline the rhythm and little pieces of synth that are based on DAC 522. Uh, so that's just one of the examples of how, um, uh, how uh, Michael Mahon's uh, component could have been used in, in demos or games. Great stuff. Now, uh, let's proceed to another amazing piece of software using advanced pulse with modulation technique, techniques. Uh, it's called Electric Duet uh, by uh, Paul Lutus. Let me load that uh, to uh, my Apple II. Artisynth was not the only piece of software for Apple II that used carrier frequency to modulate um, the uh, states state of uh, the speaker uh, between maximum and minimum. I think my favorite one is Electric Duet by uh, Paul Lotus uh, from 1980, uh, where he, as the name suggests, Electric Duet, where he was able to achieve a very clear separation between uh, two sounds played at the same time. Separation meaning you can really hear that there are two sounds playing at the same time. Uh, the the software is not only uh, a work of, of genius, it's really uh, brilliantly uh, thought through and devised and written. And Paul Lotus provides a, a actually a, a, a very nice article where he uh, goes through a step by step, through step by step by how he uh, wrote that piece of software. But it's not only brilliant, it also sounds really, really nice. I think it's my favorite sounding music production software for Apple too. Let's uh, dive right into it and hear uh, the piece uh, uh, by Bach, uh, uh, a baroque piece of music called uh, Bowery. Uh, it's in E minor and it was written for the interplay of two sounds. So it's as if perfectly suited for electric duet. Uh, let's hear how it sounds. I think it's pretty amazing. Now, I don't want to interrupt this uh, excellent piece of music. You can hear it uh, in my uh, article that is linked below uh, in its full form. But let's look at the sound wave here. I stopped uh, the oscilloscope here to show the interplay of two, three, two instruments, almost instruments here. So there's, again, there's carrier frequency, which is invisible now to us. It's uh, sort of blurred because we're zoomed, uh, zoomed out at uh, our macro view, let's call it. And we see the audible frequencies, how the two states, intermediate states, are being switched constantly to create the effect of poly polyphony. A brilliant work. And again, similarly to Artisynth by Michael Ma uh, Mahon, Paul Lotus also made the component, uh, uh, sound generating component, available to other programmers. And there are many pieces of software that uh, use that. Let me just use one example um, uh, written by uh, Walt Marcinko in 1982. Uh, it's, uh, the demo is called Music Disc uh, and uh, it uses uh, Electric Duet uh, internally and I think achieves an amazing effect. Uh, I loaded it here, I think, and I hope the mixer is on for it. Let's hear Turkish Rondo. Beautiful. Uh, again, the full uh, the full piece is uh, linked uh, in my article below. Uh, take a look, listen to it. 
these are amazing, uh, amazing pieces of work. It shows us what can be achieved given that we have very strict limitations of hardware um, and given the creativity and uh, ingenuity of, uh, of programmers and composers. Uh, how much can we achieve? I'm really, uh, really happy I could have uh, presented this to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll come back to the Apple II platform um, frequently. Um, not only to Apple II GS. Apple II GS will deserve a separate uh, uh, episode of understanding um, computer sound because it uses a different chip. Um, but even the earlier ones, the very simple Apple II e, uh, e computers, Apple II C and, and similar ones, there's a lot more that I think can be explored, especially uh, we can go into detail how carrier frequency is modulated. We can go into the mathematical aspect of it. I'm super interested in that. I don't know much about it, but I, I really want to explore it and I hope we can explore it together. But for now, let's focus on, the, let's focus on just our listening pleasure of electric duet used in, uh, uh, in uh, um, a music disc by uh, Walt Marcinko. And also, Let's now listen to a few other demos and listen to a few other um, uh, game sounds uh, just without any commentary. I leave it on uh, for you to, uh, to listen, to um, relax too, uh, and maybe we'll provide uh, just the title and author on the screen. Enjoy and talk to you uh, in our next episode of Understanding Computer Music.